Okay, everybody, um, we are going to move into the motor system, talking about motor neurons. Um, we're, we'll do a little bit of a review on um, a skeletal muscle structure, which you probably have learned in um, A and P, and then a little bit more of that in kinesiology, so it'll be a little bit of a review. Um, in my mind, I sort of separate the things that we learn in the PTA program into different categories. Um, the first category being um, what's there? What, what are the structure of things? And that's sort of a kinesiology um, A and P sort of thing. Um, the second part is what goes wrong, you know, and that is more of a uh, pathology and um, this class to some extent. And um, then we go into what do we do about it and um, that's in the, your acute care class, your modalities class, um, neuro rehab next quarter with Jamie. So um, we're going to do, uh, and this class sort of bridges in between the what's there and what goes wrong section. So um, we're going to talk about what's there with the motor system. So those of you who are into sports rehabilitation, this is your chapter. Um, this is the this is where we really find out what is the nervous system's contribution to muscle contractions and how does that affect what we do with people in therapeutic exercise. So it's pretty cool and interesting stuff. So the first thing we're going to talk about is we talked about the sensory system, the somatosensory system, and um, all that sensory information that's coming in through those spinal tracts into the brain. Well, what do we do with that information? So um, the movement control requires that sensory contribution for um, a lot of different things, but particularly we talk about um, a feed forward and feed back system. So the feed forward system is an anticipatory use of that sensory information to prepare for movement. So really that's saying, okay, what is happening out there and what are we going to do about it? Obviously a lot of the, the um, decision making and discriminated um, discriminating and dis, um, action happens in the uh, cerebral cortex. So um, we, it takes that sensory information, it feeds it forward to now what am I going to do with it? How am I going to affect the world around me using my motor control? Um, feedback, on the other hand, refers to the use of sensory information during or after movement to make corrections either um, to the ongoing movement or to future movements. So um, a lot of, we talked about the unconscious relay tracks which end in the cerebellum. Um, a lot of that unconscious relay information is part of this feedback system. The, the sensory information goes to the cerebellum, the cerebellum says, um, how can I adjust this movement to make the kind of movement that I really want to take and that all happens on an unconscious level. Okay, so that feed forward feedback idea, that's like what are we going to do with the sensory information that's going to contribute to movement control. So um, in the absence of vision, so like say you get up in the middle of the night and you are reaching out to find your phone or your clock a lot of us I think these days use our phone as clock and you're going to see what time it is you kind of have to feel around on the bed table and you're using somatosensation and proprioception to locate that phone so if you lost your somatosensation um, uh, for example that gives the example of someone with complete deafferentation um, where your uh, afferent information is not coming in it disrupts the positioning of your limbs you can't find stuff you can't figure out where you are in space. So that sensory uh, contribution is a big deal in movement control. So um, when we start to talk about the motor system, we're going to talk about um, the sequence of events that happens in a motor event. So um, there's a nice little chart in the book that I like. Oh, so in the sensory contribution to motor control, there are three senses that are integral to automatic movement. The visual sense, which we talked about a little bit, finding your phone in the dark. Um, the somatosensory, because we need that feed forward and feedback information. And the vestibular sense, which we'll talk about in chapter 14. Um, that has a big uh, effect on figuring out where we are in space and head movements relative to the sensory information that's going on around us. So. 
the, all, those three senses are integral to our automatic movement. If we lose one of them, it's going to change things. So um, the steps involved in the motor act, the first thing that has to happen, we get that sensory information, and then we have to make a decision in the anterior frontal lobe of our cerebral cortex. So the decision has to be made. What are we going to do? What is, what is our motion going to be? Um, that activates then motor planning areas in the cerebral cortex, which is a separate area from the decision-making area. Then motor control circuits in the cerebellum and basal ganglia, which regulate activity in descending motor tracts, are activated. We will talk about the cerebellum and basal ganglia in the next chapter. Um, and then descending motor tracts deliver the signals to spinal interneurons and then to the lower motor neurons. So um, we're going to talk a lot about upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons in this chapter. And so, so we don't have to write it out every time. We're going to use the abbreviation UMN for upper motor neuron and LMN for lower motor neuron. Okay, and the, the lower motor neurons transmit signals to the skeletal muscles. They go from the spine to the skeletal muscles. And um, the, what the appropriate muscle fibers, fibers then contract. So it all starts with the decision in the anterior frontal lobe, which that decision goes to the motor planning areas. Then that goes to the control circuits in the uh, basal ganglia and the cerebellum. Um, then to the descending motor pathways in the spine, to the spinal interneurons, and the lower motor neurons. The descending motor pathways can also synapse directly with those loader, mo uh, lower motor neurons, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. And then to the skeletal muscles. So um, in you know A and P and kinesiology, we talk a ton about muscles and which muscles and where they attach and all that other stuff. So here's what happens before we get to the muscles. So that's pretty pretty important information. So we're going to start talking about the structure and function of those skeletal muscles. So this should be a review for you, a review of your the information that you learned in A and P. Um, so there are four traits that skeletal muscle has that make it able to do what it can do. Number one, it's excitable. We can get that electrical impulse from the uh, motor neuron that tells us that fires up that skeletal muscle and tells it to contract. Number two, it's contractile. So the muscle can contract when it gets that electrical signal. Uh, number three, it's extensile. So um, the, it can contract and it can extend. So it doesn't just contract and stay there, it also extends. And also it's elastic, so there's a little bit of a bounce back in the muscle. Okay, um, the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of muscle cells. And so each cell kind of has its own little name um, for its plasma membrane. But just like the neuron and just like every other cell in our body, it's got that lipid, double lipid plasma membrane layer. And it's the sarcolemma in the muscles. And myofibrils are proteins arranged in sarcomeres that are parallel to the long axis of the muscle fiber. So the sarcomere is the functional unit of muscle. The amount of tension generated by a contracting muscle depends on the length of the sarcomeres. So you may remember way back in kinesiology um, when we talked about the length tension relationship of muscles. Here's where it comes in. So this is important stuff um, that we're reviewing. So um, if the sarcomere is too long in a stretch position, we're not going to get the, the ideal muscle contraction. And uh, conversely, if it's too short, we will also not get the best muscle contraction. So um, there's a little animated video on uh, muscle fibers, which we love those little animated videos. So I'm um, talking about the length tension relationship. The sarcomere at its optimal length allows for the maximum number of cross bridge connections between the actin and the myosin. Um, and that generates maximal tension in the muscle. That's the length tension relationship. This should not be new information to you. So in this little diagram, um, it shows the actin is the little blue strand. The myosin is the little green strand. The titan are those little orange strands, and titan is a um, structural muscle in the sarcomere. It 
prevents the sarcomere from being pulled apart when the muscle is stretched. So that contributes to one of the components um, of muscle or one of its characteristics being elastic. It has to be able to be elastic. So um, at normal sarcomere lengths, the titan maintains the position of the myosin in the center of the sarcomere. So in the diagram, the second part of the diagram, part B, shows the titan is kind of a little bit, it's not all the way stretched out. It's a little bit wavy, and it's sort of keeping that myosin in the middle so it can have maximal um, contact with the actin. So um, there are th three proteins, really, or three um, structures in the individual sarcomere that sort of determine the structure. So the Z line is at the end of each sarcomere. The M line anchors fibers in the center. And then the titan connects in between the Z line and the M line. And the titan actually contributes to stiffness in an intact nervous system. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. But it, it sort of maintains the structure of that muscle fiber. So the, the myofibril is the, all the little sarcomeres lined up. Um, those all bind together into one individual muscle fiber. So um, the proteins that are, so the, the titan and the Z-line and the M-line, those are the structural proteins in the sarcomere. The proteins that are involved in muscle contraction are myosin and actin. Remember those guys? Of course you do. So at the neuromuscular junction, when the muscle is excited by the binding of acetylcholine at that neuromuscular junction, we get that action potential um, in the neuron, in the motor neuron. It releases acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Um, the at, so it's that lower motor neuron. The acetylcholine binds with receptors on the sarcolemma. It causes local depolarization of the muscle cell membrane which elicits the release of calcium from those calcium stores within the muscle cell. Calcium binds to troponin, which releases the tropomyosin from the actin and allows the myosin to bind with the actin and produces that muscle contraction. So none of this should be new information to you. This should all sound super, super familiar. So the action potential arrives in the top picture. It depolarizes the um, sarcolemma which releases the calcium from the T-tubules in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It binds with the troponin. Um, it moves the tropomyosin and reveals those binding sites so the myosin can then bind to the actin. Okay, that should all sound familiar. You should know those steps in muscle contraction. So none of this should be new information to you, but it's an excellent review because it's been a while since we've had it. So um, we will just go over a little bit in the, um, the, the um, motor system again, um, just that sequence of events. The neural activity begins with the decision made in the anterior frontal lobe. It activates motor planning areas followed by the control circuits in the cerebellum and basal ganglia to that regulate activity in the upper motor neuron tracts. Those upper motor neuron tracts, which are spinal tracts, we'll talk a little more about them later, they deliver signals to the spinal inner neurons and the lower motor neurons. And those lower motor neurons are the ones that synapse at the neuromuscular junction with the skeletal muscles, and they elicit the contraction of muscle. And that's moving our arms. So it's voluntary movement. It's controlled from the top down. The brain makes a decision. It sends it through the spinal cord to the muscle. That's how the action works. Okay, so the, um, the PowerPoint has the little pictures that are also in the module um, of the different structures. You should definitely be familiar with those guys. Um, muscle contraction is produced when the actin slides relative to the myosin. Repeated attachment of the myosin to the actin, swiveling and detachment of the myosin heads produces the contraction of the muscle. Okay, so that's really the, the total um, muscle contraction 
how it happens. So muscles have some in innate resistance to stretch. So the, they behave somewhat like springs, not entirely like springs. It's not an exact analogy. Um, it, but when a spring is stretched way out, it has less, you know, a longer spring has less resistance to stretch than a shorter spring. If you took a short little spring, it's harder to stretch. If you have a big long one, it stretches more. So kind of like muscles, a longer muscle has um, less resistance to stretch. So um, stretch springs generate more resistance to stretch than the same spring when it's shortened. So if you have it all stretched out, same thing with the muscle. If the muscle's all stretched out at the end of its range, it's going to have more resistance to stretch. Okay? So the, th the things that determine the total resistance to muscle stretch, and this is, again, in a healthy, intact system, are active contraction of the muscle. If you're actively contracting your muscle, you're going to have more resistance to stretch. The titan, which is that structural protein, that produces resistance to stretch. And then we get weak actin, myosin bonds. Um, and a lot of times, you know, like you're sitting on the couch for a while, maybe watching the Seahawks game <laughs> or something where you're there for a long time. You get up and the first couple steps, you're a little bit uncoordinated. You feel kind of stiff. You have those weak actin, myosin bonds because they've just been sitting there next to each other. They haven't been doing anything. Um, and you have to break those weak bonds before you can move normally again. So um, I kind of say it's a little bit like old Velcro. Um, it, it takes a little effort to pull it apart, but not much, because it's, it's old Velcro. It's wearing out. So those little weak actin myosin bonds, the longer you sit, the more weak bonds you have, and the more resistance you have to muscle stretch when you get up. Okay, so there's a little graph that shows the um, the relationship between the length of a muscle and its resistance to stretch. Um, you don't really have to know the graph, but you know how much I like graphs, so I have to put it in there. Um, so we're going to talk about the concept of muscle tone. So unfortunately, the fitness industry has sort of um, co-opted that term muscle tone to mean something different, like um, a muscle that is, you've worked out and it's in shape, has good tone, and, um, you know, if you're flabby and out of shape, you don't have good muscle tone. Okay, we're going to erase that definition from our minds. What we're going to talk about in terms of muscle tone is the resistance to stretch in a resting muscle. Clinically, we use passive range of motion to assess muscle tone. So passive range of motion means we're moving the patient's arm, the patient is not moving their own arm. How much resistance to stretch do we have in that? And that is muscle tone. So it's passive range of motion that's used to assess muscle tone. When muscle tone is normal, resistance to passive stretch is minimal. So when someone has normal muscle tone, you should just be able to move their arm through their available range of motion. Um, it's not going to resist you a lot. Um, so normal resting muscle tone is provided by the structural protein titan and those weak actin myosin bonds. So that's normal. We all have it. It's not a neurological abnormality or anything like that. We have normal muscle tone um, and it's minimal resistance to passive stretch. Okay. So um, there's a little diagram that shows it. We won't necessarily go through the whole thing, but it's there for you. So the number of sarcomeres that we have determines the muscle length, right? So if the sarcomeres are lined up end to end, end to end in each one of those myofibrils. So um, when, even if you take a healthy innervated muscle and immobilize it in a shortened position for a prolonged period, you will lose sarcomeres. Sarcomeres will disappear from the ends of the myofibrils. And the loss of the sarcomeres, it's a structural adaptation to the shortened position so we can maintain the optimum link tension relationship so that when we contract the muscle, it generates optimal force at that new resting length. So if I took you right now and I stuck you in a sling, even though you're not injured or anything like that, and I kept you in that sling for a couple months, when I took you out of the sling, you probably would not be able to fully straighten your arm. The muscle will have structurally shortened with a loss of sarcomeres. Okay, and so 
when that structurally shortened muscle is stretched, it quickly reaches the limits of its elasticity and it'll be resistance. It'll be resistant to that stretching. So now we had you in that sling for um, however long, for a couple months, and now we take you out and we try to stretch your arm straight, it, you're going to get a lot of resistance. If the muscle it has actually structurally shortened. So conversely, if the muscle is immobilized in a lengthened position, the muscle will add new sarcomeres and become longer. So the upshot of this is if you never stretch, never, ever, 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 and people are out there who never stretch, you never go through your full range of motion, you will lose range of motion, even if you're completely 100% healthy. Okay? Um, if you stretch a lot, like say you do yoga every day, or you go through your stretching program every day, you will keep your muscles in an optimally lengthened position. The muscle will add new sarcomeres to adapt to that, and um, this is a good thing. We want people to stretch, and this is why, because we want a, a lot of sarcomeres. So the, the muscle length is there for us when we need it. We have a maximum range of motion. Okay, so we talked about muscle resistance to movement, and now we're going to talk a little bit about joint resistance to movement. So um, co-contraction refers to the simultaneous contraction of antagonist muscles. So we talked about this a little bit in kinesiology. So um, it stabilizes your joints. So it, it's like you're on a train, you're on a moving train, and you're trying to stand still. All the muscles are contracting, both the agonists and the antagonists, everybody's contracting to stabilize your joints and keep you up in that position. In the upper limbs, it enables that precise movement, fine motor skills like writing or um, playing the piano or any, <laughs> any precise movement. In the lower limbs, it allows you to stand on an unstable surface, so like on the moving train. So the co-contraction um, helps stabilize your joints and it produces more joint resistance to movement and muscle contraction. Okay, there are some videos in the um, module that talk about the sliding filament theory and the nice thing is they're super short, they're animated. <laughs> nice, super short talk about that, just your normal muscle contraction, the sliding filament theory, which we've talked about before in other classes. Um, there's a little, there's some pictures from the book about the, um, the stiffness and the sarcomeres adding more structurally and structurally lengthening the muscle or shortening the muscle. Um, so a muscle contracture is when you have that structurally um, shortened muscle. So people who are immobile and sit and just sit with their arms up on the arms of a wheelchair or something all day, they probably have contractures in their, in their arms and legs and it's harder for them to move. So um, there are some videos that are showing, it's that neurological exam guy again, and um, it's showing abnormal muscle tone. And, or it's showing how you test for muscle tone, actually. So um, the normal resistance to stretch, and we're still talking about normal yet, we haven't even started talking about what goes wrong, um, is produced by those minimal weak cross bridges between the actin and myosin. Um, the intrinsic stiffness that's provided by the titan, and um, titan is a little bit elastic and it's providing structure for that sarcomere. And so when muscles are stretched in a relaxed state, you slowly break those little cross bridges and you don't have a lot of resistance. Okay, so in an intact, there's this diagram from the book, the summary, it's summarizing the factors that contribute to muscle resistance to stretch. It, this is in an intact nervous system. So Titan is one of them, just that structural protein. It contributes to resistance to stretch that weak actin mice and cross bridging. Um, proprioceptive information, including reflexes, can contribute a little bit. So it's a little bit of that feed forward feedback system. Um, it's anticipating something that might happen, so you get a little bit of that. And some descending motor commands, and we'll talk 
more about those in um, chapter 11 when we're talking about the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. But if you if your descending motor commands are um, not inhibiting muscle tone, you could get more resistance to stretch. Okay, so it's those descending motor commands, um, proprioceptive information, including reflexes, weak cross bridging between actin and myosin, and tighten that structural protein. Those all contribute to muscle resistance in an intact nervous system. So during fast stretches, cross bridges don't have time to separate. When you stretch them slowly, you're kind of pulling each one of those little ones apart and there's not a lot of resistance. If you try to stretch really fast, there's more resistance because the cross bridges don't have time to separate. So if the muscle remains immobile, you, s you keep forming those weak cross bridges and your muscle is stiffer and stiffer. So that's the phenomenon of you're sitting in class for two hours, you get up and you feel stiff. This phenomenon is more pronounced as we get older. And um, so you will hear people say that, wow, I get this, we call it startup stiffness sometimes. Um, I, when I first get up in the morning or after I've been sitting for a while, I'm just stiff as a board. And then as soon as they start moving, they feel a lot better. So um, if normal muscle is stretched s after a um, prolonged contraction, um, the muscle stiffness is increased. So you s you're sitting for a while, you get up, and you, you feel really super stiff, and then after the first few steps, you get going. Um, so that's kind of uh, a little bit about that. And so the co-contraction, it's the simultaneously contraction of the antagonist muscles. Um, the stretch shortening cycle is used to generate maximal muscle force when an eccentric contraction is followed immediately by a concentric contraction. So if you think of that um, in terms of um, its plyometrics, the same thing. You do an eccentric contraction, like lowering into a squat, and right after that you jump up and do the concentric contraction in the same muscles. Um, that produces a rebound effect and a greater um, concentric contraction because you, you use the stored energy in the elastic components of muscle fibers. Um, another sports example of that is like winding up for a kick or winding up for a pitch or to throw the ball. You first you eccentrically contract and then you concentrically contract and it gives you more power in that um, concentric contraction. So I'm going to wrap this part up. We talked about the normal things. We're going to next talk about lower motor neurons and um, all their cute little idiosyncrasies. Um, and then we will start talking about some of the pathologies involved with it, which is the really cool and interesting stuff.